We're an island nation, drawn to the sea that surrounds us. A playground for some. For others, it's where they make their living. But the sea's unpredictable. It's Mother Nature, it's a beast. There to save our lives is a volunteer army of over 5,000 ordinary people. Cheers, mate. Ready to leave their jobs, their families, and race to our rescue. When the Pedro goes, it's that adrenaline rush every single time. You could make the difference between life and death. I feel very lucky. Then bringing me back to life again was a miracle. OK. Equipped with their own cameras. Just the two of you. Come on, yes. The crews give us a unique insight into every call-out. Nice deep breaths, OK? All right. As only they see it. The ambulance is here, OK? For those who risk their lives, yeah. it has become a way of life. Come on! Bringing loved ones home. OK. There's really no better feeling in the world. eastern tip of the Scottish mainland, just a few miles from John O'Groats, lies the small harbour town of Wick, population just over 7,000. Wick is a nice place to live. There's a real community spirit here that probably doesn't exist in a lot of places now. Most of the people you walk past on the street, kind of, you can say hello to and you know their face or you know them. There's a real focus on the harbour in the town, the community. Um, come down and, and view the harbour, sit by the harbour and watch what's going on. Perched on the edge of the harbour, but at the very heart of this tight-knit community, is Wick Lifeboat Station. The town was built around the harbour and that's probably why their support that we as a station get is huge. You can't put a figure or, or feeling on it, it's, it's a strong thing. Being exposed to the North Sea's extreme conditions brings its own challenges. There's loads of different sea conditions. It can be flat calm one hour, and then the next hour you've got a force eight. Oh, rain and winds howling, which is quite normal for us. It can turn really treacherous. And if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, it's, it's not good. A blustery August afternoon, a 20-mile-an-hour wind blowing offshore. I was actually down at harbour, which is right next to the station, working on me and my father's fishing boat, and the pagers went off. This shout was an immediate launch, so that means it's time critical. You know that there's something urgent. A call has come in from the Coast Guard about a paddleboarder being blown out to sea off Sinclair's Bay, four miles north of the station. The first informant was the lady's husband who was on the shore and could see his wife about a mile offshore getting pushed further out to sea. Within minutes, the station's Trent-class lifeboat launches and at its top speed of 25 knots, heads to the paddleboarder's last reported position. There's a bit of urgency, obviously, sooner that you can get to the casualty, the less chance that they have of, of drifting even further afield of where they were last seen. Paddleboard will be affected by wind massively because it's really light. There's generally nothing below the water and you're just sitting on, on top of the water. Even at full throttle, it takes the lifeboat 10 minutes to reach Sinclair's Bay by which time the paddleboarder's husband can no longer see his wife from the shore. She was out for longer than she'd ever been out before, but at some point I realised, you know, something's not right here. When you're in that situation, time does slow down. It does feel like help's taking forever to appear. As we were getting closer to our last known possession, it was becoming quite apparent that there was no one there, no one to be seen. If you just keep your eyes on, yeah. uh, we need to not naked eye as much as you can. That's what's going to help us. We had people up on the flying bridge looking. We got a thermal camera out as well. 
but we just couldn't sport at all. I was really concerned. I immediately briefed Alex to start drawing up a, a search pattern. Okay, so from this position headed east now is where they reckon, so we're just going to start searching. Yeah. The longer it takes to find someone, the search area becomes bigger and bigger. We didn't know what had happened, whether she was just too far out, whether she was lying down, and obviously no longer being able to see her was disconcerting. There's uh, a bit of doubt spreading in once you get there and uh, you don't spot a person immediately. There's that many places that she could be. Is she further out to sea? Has she been blown in a cave? It's all going through your mind of where she could be. And in the back of your mind, you know there's someone here. This is a real human being that we're looking for. So there's a lot of pressure there. Back on the beach, Simon, with his two young children, can only look on helplessly. I don't think the kids really realised at the time just what had happened, but I suddenly realised that things had suddenly gone into the, the unknown. I think that you can see us with a stick of air above or something. Stick a paddle up, start waving that thing. The Coast Guard have issued a pan pan, an urgent call out to any boats in the area for help in finding the paddle border. A fishing vessel has responded and is heading to the location. The sea does feel like a big place when you're looking for something so small, so it's reassuring knowing there's another boat coming. You're thinking, Ollie, what ifs? So, yeah, it's a paddle border that we've been called to, but could have been uh, thrown off. And it could just be a person, but you're effectively looking for a head. You tell me she's got buoyancy on her. Well, the last one's dead now. Even in August, the temperature in this part of the North Sea is around just 12 degrees. I'm not sure how long people would be able to cope in that temperatures, but it wouldn't be a long time. As you're looking through binoculars after a while, you almost start to think that you're seeing things. Is that just buoys out in the water right there? It's just, it's being covered by breakwater just now, but basically right in front of my After 10 minutes of searching, more news comes over the radio. Yeah, we've got, uh, you've got eyes on the cars here, you've made them towards it just now, Robert. <laughs> just over a mile west, the crew of the fishing vessel Reaper believe they've spotted the casualty. We left our search area that we were in and proceeded at full speed to where they were. You get ready to do help for recovery. As we closed in towards the fishing vessel Reaper, we could see them very clearly. They're quite a big vessel and they were giving us instruction as to where the casualty was. We were approximately 50 metres away from the casualty before we could actually see her in the water. I the water there. Right beside them, the water. That's her. As the crew draw closer, they spot that the casualty is lying face down on her paddleboard. She wasn't moving. Right, get up there, try to shout to her, speak to her, see if you can get her to get a response. Graham's up. Graham! was in my mouth, I'll be honest. Just as the crew prepared to pull the casualty towards the lifeboat. The casualty turned her head to acknowledge the crew member shouting towards her, uh, and that, that was a huge relief. You OK? I think fear and panic had probably taken over. Kind of almost seemed she was kind of had like a death grip on the paddleboard and was scared to move. We'll get you up first, you'll take a strap off. Perfect. Sir, you want to grab his hand first, all right? Right, on you go. Just take your time, take your time. Right. Safely on board, the casualty is taken to the wheelhouse to be warmed up and checked over. 
We quickly realised she was cold, but otherwise okay. I couldn't imagine what was going through her head, obviously. Uh, she had a husband and two kids back on the shore that was obviously looking for her and, and missing her. I was preparing myself for both ways, um, and, and, and once they told me, it was obviously, it was just so much relief. Earlier that day, Sheena and Simon had made the trip to Sinclair's Bay for a family day out on the beach. It was quite calm on the beach, um, and that's probably because there was a big sand dune behind us. Um, so we didn't really realise quite how windy it was. So I got on the paddle board. I had put uh, the life vests on the kids, but not myself, because the plan was that I was just going to pop out for a minute and then come in and maybe they would have a go out with me. But with the strong offshore wind, Sheena soon found herself being pushed far out into the bay. I shouted to my family, who couldn't hear me because the wind was pushing my voice away. My body acted like a bit of a sail, um, so I got pushed out quite quickly, and then I kind of panicked. Everything that I was doing to try and get to shore wasn't successful at all. I was really hoping that Simon had realised that there was a problem. I was aware of how deep the water was below me, so I felt quite panicked about that. The thing that was the most frightening was the wind, which was just constantly buffeting my face and pushing me out. And I felt safer with my whole body on the board um, because I could grab it with my hands and my feet, and I felt that I was less likely to be washed off. By this point, Sheena was nearly a mile out to sea, and had no idea if help was on the way. When you're suddenly put in a scenario when the world is bigger than you are and you can't do anything about that, it becomes a frightening place to be. The first boat that I saw was a fishing boat. So I heard it and then I saw it. I was so relieved. And then on the right-hand side, I saw the smaller RNLI boat. Right, get up there, try to shout to her, speak to her, see if you can get her to get a response. I was too frightened to wave because I thought I might fall off the board, so I just sort of lay there and hoped that they might scoop me out. An hour and a half after setting off from the beach, Sheena and her paddleboard finally made it back to shore. This shout had the potential to have a very, very dark outcome. Had she got set out to sea, in all likelihood, she would have been knocked off her board with the first wave that would have hit her. Uh, and that's somebody in the water then, and you wouldn't last long. Once we got back to the, the station and reunited the lady with her husband, it was a realisation that this, this was a mother and a wife that would reunited with her family. One of the crew members came and took me upstairs to see Sheena, and, and obviously, I think my first instinct was to give my wife a hug and, and then say thank you to the, the whole team. It's just odd to have so much gratitude for somebody you hardly know, like, or you don't really know. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them, so, like, you can never say thank you enough. Volunteer crews of the RNLI's 238 lifeboat stations can be paged at any time, day or night, calling them away from friends, families and colleagues to head out into the unknown. You're on call 24-7. It's a way of life. It doesn't matter if it's Christmas Day, Valentine's Day or even a wedding. Whenever the shout comes in, lifeboat crew will respond. You are always planned. You're parking your car the right way around to get out quicker and, and stuff like that, but you're always ready. Stay, Bubba. Clever girl. I 
started a new job and we had uh, five shouts in eight days. Come on, quickly, get on. I still got the job. <laughs> if you get a shout in the early hours, you know it's something serious. Let go, let go. Right away. I'm there to help my community. So whenever the pager is going off and I'm available, I'll, I will go. We are there and we stand by 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And on that note, I'm off. <laughs> Lying on the Dorset coast, on the eastern edge of Christchurch Harbour, is the small seaside community of Muddyford. Muddyford is a old fishing village. During the winter time, it's quite a quiet place. When the summer comes, it's like somebody turns on a light switch and the key is buzzing. I think in many ways, a quintessential British seaside town. It's just a really chilled out, lovely place to be. I couldn't imagine living anywhere else. It's not even worth going away on holiday, really. There's been a lifeboat station in Muddiford for 60 years, with the current lifeboat, a B-Class Atlantic 85, well suited to the shifting sandbanks and heavy tidal swells on this part of the coast. The weather changes very quickly around uh, Muddiford. Uh, it's very tidal. It can all of a sudden become very rough. You can get swall come through. It can change from a force four up to a force seven, and you can end up in quite a dangerous situation. 58-year-old Ian is the oldest seagoing crew member at Muddiford and has lived here all his life. I started when I was 17 years old. You had to get a letter signed by your mum to say you're allowed to go. So it's been a few years now. I wouldn't know how many shouts I've been on, really. It's a lot. It's over a 1,000. My family's used to me disappearing when the pager goes off. There's no surprises for them. It's just, Dad's gone again. <laughs> the person who's most accustomed to Ian being on call 24 hours a day is his wife, Liz. Liz has had to make lots of sacrifices over the years because of what I do. When we bought the house, we could only look for a house in Muddyford. And there was the time when you went into labour. Yes. <laughs> Again, it's one of those occasions where the pager went off. We knew it was something that was quite urgent. She looked at me and said, just, just go, didn't you? Yep, off you go. So. I thought I might have been in the bad books by, uh, by the time I got back, but uh, I did get back as quickly as I could. You weren't in the bad books at all. I understood that it was an important shout. It is a sacrifice, but it is worth it. Mid-autumn 2013. A gale is churning up the sea and hammering Muddiford with 40 mile an hour southwesterly winds. This was a Sunday afternoon. I was at home having some downtime. And then the pager went. The local Coast Guard has received a mayday call from a rigid inflatable boat known as a rib, three miles east of the station. This was off of Barton-on-Sea, had almost capsized with three persons on board. Knowing what the sea state gets like down there, I realised that they were probably in some serious trouble. The Muddyford lifeboat is prepared for immediate launch. All shouts feel time critical, but particularly a mayday, it always makes you be on your A-game. Just minutes after receiving the mayday, the crew clear the launching platform and head out towards Barton-on-Sea. It was blowing about a force eight. The conditions were rough. In a force eight southwesterly in Christchurch, you could be talking at waves that are 10 foot high. The atmosphere on board was fairly tense. We knew that the situation could be dire for the people we were going out to. Four minutes after launching, the crew spot the rib dead ahead. As we first saw the rib, it was being absolutely thrown around in the swells and the surf. 
battling the conditions, the rib skipper has been trying, without success, to make it back to harbour. On a normal shout, we would transfer them from their vessel to our boat. The conditions on that day, it was just not possible to do that. So we made the decision that actually the most sensible thing to do was to transfer one of us to their boat and aid them back into safe haven. As Helm, it's Ian's call. But transferring a crew member across to the rib in seas this big is not without risk. Even though we're trained, it takes guts of one of our crew members to actually do that. It was decided that I would go onto the casualty vessel. It's very high risk of him getting injured while doing that. If falling into the sea and getting crushed in between the two boats. It is a tough call to make. If it doesn't go right, it's something you could have to live with for the rest of your life. Carrying out the transfer requires both boats to head into the waves at exactly the same speed. In those kind of conditions, it's very difficult to communicate with a howling wind, breaking seas. You're shouting across, trying to make a point, which is very difficult in a situation like that. Its bow is probably rising 12 foot above the waves, and it was almost leaving the water as it was hitting some of the larger waves. We had to pick the time when we were going to be at the same height, both vessels, to be able to transfer our crewmen across. I know that I can trust him. When I ask him to make the manoeuvre, he knows that he can trust me to get him in the best position. As the lifeboat draws closer, it takes all of Ian's skill to prevent the two vessels from colliding. The bow of the lifeboat was violently rising and falling as we approached. You just get that one moment in time where you think sort of all the planets have aligned and you can literally know that that's the right moment to take the jump. Once I was on board, I think they all breathed a massive sigh of relief. They were very distressed and scared, I guess. Talking to the skipper, he didn't feel quite confident in those conditions, so I was more than happy to take the helm of the boat uh, and drive it back to Mudderford. Even though Justin now has control of the rib, the crew on the B-Class are still on high alert. We followed closely behind so that if the boat did tip over or anybody fell overboard, we were in a position to immediately pick people up. 25 minutes after the pagers went off, the Atlantic escorts the rib back into the safety of Muddyford Quay in Christchurch Marina. There was a big sigh of relief from everybody that we'd made it into calm water. Although the casualties were wet and cold, they didn't need any medical assistance. And after a quick assessment, they were um, cleared to, to make their way home. Although the skipper was probably a competent skipper, had we not done the transfer, that rib may not have made it. It just shows you how easy it is that you can get caught out changing sea and weather conditions. It can happen to anybody. The sea can be a cruel place. In the northeast corner of Aberdeenshire lies the bustling town of Fraserburgh. There's been a harbour here since the 1590s. From humble beginnings, it's now one of the busiest shellfish ports in Europe. Fraserburgh is a busy port. Um, lots of fishing boats coming in and out, a lot of work boats coming in and out. Commercial fishing up here is, is quite big. You just need to look at the harbour and see how much boats are there in to know how busy a place it is. Fraserburgh Lifeboat Station was founded in 1858, the very first RNLI station in Scotland. 
It currently has an active crew of 24, 19 of whom have a seafaring background. Friends were alive with station. I would say we're not a team, I would say we're all like a family. It's open to interpretation. There's always good banter between the guys and girls. Everyone gets on with everyone. This week, Fraserburgh has one new crew member. As a resilience coxswain, Ethan provides stations with temporary cover when crew are on leave or unwell. I get to travel all over Scotland, meet all the different lifeboat crews. In my time in this role, I've probably covered over 15 lifeboat stations around Scotland. At the age of 26, Ethan is the youngest resilience coxswain in the RNLI. So it can be quite a big step going into a lifeboat station that you've never been to. Particularly for me as a younger person, it can be quite hard to go into a station and earn the trust of, of those people that you will be uh, their coxswain. Hi, Vic. Hi, I'm in Foot Lake. How you doing, Good to see you again. Thank you. Thanks for coming across. A like um, really important part of this role is to uh, learn off of the crew that you've got use their local knowledge. They know the area better than I ever will, so it's, it's really important. On this particular stretch of coastline, facing out into the wild North Sea, local knowledge can mean the difference between life and death. Fraserburgh is a beautiful coastline, but it's got a notorious history. And most notorious of all is a rocky outcrop known as Cairn Bulk Point. A 28-foot-high beacon was erected on Cairnbulg in 1858 as a refuge for sailors from boats that had foundered here. Cairnbulg Point sticks out from the shoreline. Um, it's really shallow. It's very easy to get caught out with it. Almost been caught up myself in low water, like just not paying attention. Over the years, these rocks, barely visible above the surface, have been the cause of over 20 wrecks, including the fishing trawler The Sovereign, which ran aground in thick fog in 2005. All five crew were rescued, but the boat wasn't so lucky. All these years after, and it's still sitting there. When you pass The Sovereign, it almost reminds you, keep on your toes, stay alert. We don't want to end up there. Two hours before dawn on a cold and foggy October morning. I'd arrived in Fraserburgh on the Sunday evening, uh, ready to take over to cover that week. Ethan and three other crew members have arrived at the station in the early hours to take the Trent class lifeboat up the coast for some routine maintenance. We had been getting kitted up when one of the crew had gone upstairs to turn the lights off in the crew room when he told us that he'd overheard on a mayday on the VHF. Probably a minute to seconds later, the pagers went off. The mayday has come in from a trawler, the ocean maid, that has hit the rocks at Cairnbulk Point with four fishermen on board. Mayday is as, as, as serious as it gets, yeah. OK, all right, clear. The crew launch immediately and head out into the darkness. So it was quite a poor morning. There was quite a significant swell rolling through the harbour and as we were on our way to the casualty, we were punching into it. The darkness always puts a, an extra element into the call out, if you like. And I suppose that's where the training and, and local knowledge comes into, into play. As the crew make their way towards Cairnbulk Point, two miles southeast of the station, an urgent update comes in from the Coast Guard. Four crew have abandoned the vessel. They're reporting they are now dangerously close to the rock. Once we heard that the guys were abandoning the ship and going into life raft, that's sort of when the dynamic of the shout changed. Keeping the boat as long as possible and obviously desperate for going into life raft. Desperate. Five minutes after launching, the Ocean Maid comes into view through the fog. We've just seen the boat lights, a boat at a 45 degree, laying on the, the port side. She was rolling with the swell that was coming in as the waves were breaking over her port side. We could see the life raft on her starboard side. But in the darkness, and with rocks just below the surface, the Trent class can't get any closer to the life raft. 
In the life raft, you have a set of oars, and that's about it. Other than that, you are at the mercy of the sea. With the life raft in imminent danger of hitting the rocks or being crushed under the rolling boat, the crew have to find a way to reach it before it's too late. We knew that we wouldn't be able to get in with the ALB, so our only kind of option was utilising the XP boat. At just under three metres, the inflatable XP boat is one of the smallest vessels in the RNLI's fleet. It's not designed for the weather that we encountered that morning. It was borderline for the XP actually going, so it's running through the back of your head. Are we doing the right thing? Great, somebody's dirty their jacket. We knew that it was our only kind of option to, to save those four lives. Switch yourself. With the life raft edging ever closer to the rocks, Ethan selects Shane and Stephen to man the XP boat. Definitely feeling the heat, sending two people that I'd only just met maybe five minutes before into a small boat in a big sea to rescue four people. Good job. Right. The XP boat heads straight for the life raft, 200 metres away. Just hold on, Shane. Just hold on for God's sake. Not only did I think about my own safety, I was thinking about my best mate's safety, who was also in the XP boat. Try and keep the boat as even as we can. It was quite choppy, so she was up and down. It was just crazy, like... I'm going to keep a look out, cos you may come up the rock shortly. I can see the bottom, I think. But I think to be the bottom is. It was quite scary. At the time, you're trying to remember your local knowledge, figuring out where all the bad rocks are around about the beacon. If we'd taken our propeller on the rocks, that would have been us out of the game. The XP boat edges closer to the life raft, mindful of the rocks that have already claimed one vessel and attempt to make contact with its crew. Hello! Hello! So we tried shouting at them. Because of the dark, we couldn't see them very well. There's only a small light fitted to the life raft. Yeah, but we managed to get their attention. You ready to catch us, rope, boys? We're going to try and tow you out. Back out the big boat, OK? Stephen threw a line. The guys managed to catch it first time. All right, okay, wait. All right, you, you mark her fast. With the tow established, the XP boat can now pull the life raft away from danger. Take the life boat XP9. I'm kind of struggling here, but I think we'll get here, right? Well, I wouldn't say we made good progress towing with the XP boat, but we we made progress, and it was enough to keep moving. She's gone. She's gone. Once they were close enough we managed to throw a heaving line from the ALB to the life raft. See our first line. Disconnect, that'll be perfect. Right, spoiler, that's a clear, that's a clear. Clear. After 30 minutes in the life raft, the fishermen are brought onto the safety of the all-weather lifeboat. The four fishermen looked shocked. They looked a bit scared. They were all in various states of dress. I think a lot of them had been sleeping at the time when the boat ran aground. The lifeboat turns to head back to station, leaving the stricken ocean maid rolling on the rocks of Cairnbulk Point. It was just lifting up, bang, up, down, bang. It's a very tragic thing to watch, yeah. I mean, you're watching a man's livelihood be broken up. The sound of the wood smashing was just... It's a sound that you'll, you'll never leave. It just, you could just hear the crunch every roll. It's a noise that I'll not forget. After a successful five-day fishing trip, Gordon and his three fellow crew, including his father, were heading to Fraserburgh Harbour for some minor repairs. We were all kind of in giddy and in good spirits. Two o'clock, I think it was. I turned in and went to bed and passed the watch on to uh, the crewman. We just got to shout to get up to have a cup of tea before before we entered the harbour, like we always do. And just as we got to shout, 
we felt the initial grounding. With strong winds and poor visibility, the ocean maid had drifted onto the rocks at Cairn Bulk Point. As we were trying to get up the ladder, she just list, listed hard over with the, the swell and the cups of tea came down, down a ladder on top of us. She was so far up on the rock that there was no way she was coming off. As the trawler was now in danger of breaking up on the rocks, Gordon and the crew had no option but to abandon ship and step into their tiny life raft. We were trying our best to push the life raft so she would drift clear, but it was daunting to see a 70-foot boat just rolling down on top of you. Hello! Hello! It wasn't until the lifeboat were near enough on scene before we knew that the lifeboat had arrived. I stood up, looked round and see the, the small boat was just maybe about 30 feet from us. An hour after hitting the rocks, Gordon and the crew finally made it to Fraserburgh Harbour. Right, hand, well, right. After being warmed up and treated for shock, they were reunited with their families later that morning. They didn't pick us up. I don't know where we would have ended up. In that particular, we could have lost our lives. It was a horrible experience. I think they were definitely lucky to escape with our lives that day. I went back the next morning. I had to go. I just had to get a wee bit of closure. You could just see her lying on her side. By that point, she she was gone. It's a difficult situation to see. It's not just a boat. It's it's somebody's livelihood. It, it's people's jobs. It has a big impact on them, definitely. There isn't any days. At some point, something will flash back, and I don't know if that's ever going to go away. You can definitely replace a boat, but you can't replace someone's life. Four hundred and seventy miles away, in the southeast corner of England, lies the historic seaside town of Walmer. Walmer is quite steeped in history. Walmer Castle was home to the Duke of Wellington at one point. We've got the beach literally on our doorstep, so anyone who lives in Walmer can be in the sea within, you know, five minutes of leaving their front door. When the sun shines, it's very nice. There's lots of little ice cream parlours and fish and chip shops. It's traditional southeast England seaside town. With so much activity along this stretch of coast, Warmer Lifeboat Station, established in 1856, is also a hive of activity. In the summer months, as most little coastal towns, we can have inflatables getting blown offshore with an offshore breeze, paddleboarders, kayakers, that sort of thing. Early April, an overcast day with winds gusting up to 20 knots. I was just about to go for a cup of coffee in the local cafe. I was working just around the corner from the lifeboat station. A catamaran has been spotted capsizing about a mile out from the station. When I found out what the tasking was, I was a little bit taken back. Looking at the weather conditions out there, I wasn't expecting a small sailing vessel to be out at sea alone. There's going to potentially be lines in the water and stuff like that, all right? Do the calls of the Coast Guard, but I'm going to concentrate on getting there as quick as I can. Adding to the urgency, two people have now been spotted in the water next to the upturned catamaran. We do not know the state of the casualties, so we need to make sure that we are on scene as safely and quickly as possible. Minutes and seconds can make all the difference to saving someone's life before someone goes under. See, that's when the, you get a bit of an adrenaline kick because you're like, right, two people in the water, let's get out there as quick as possible. Less than 10 minutes after the alarm was raised, the station's Atlantic 85 is launched. The seas were fairly lumpy out there, and the wind being 20 knots made it a little bit challenging. At their top speed of 35 knots, the crew head to where the catamaran was spotted. On the way to scene, we are assuming worst case scenario, assuming we're looking for two casualties and not the boat. So a sharp lookout was required all the way. 
If someone was to say drift away from that situation and not be accounted for, they're going to end up in the shipping lane and that is definitely not the place you want to be. It takes the crew just a few minutes to cover the distance to the stricken catamaran. I'm coming alongside the vessel. We couldn't see any occupants. Um, so the first thing to do is do a 360 of the vessel to make sure that the uh, if there are any occupants anywhere else. As the crew circle the catamaran, they spot the casualties standing on its hull. Guys, just the two of you. You need some help? The sailors, two teenagers, have been in the water now for 25 minutes, desperately trying to right the catamaran. Sea temperatures were cold. They're jumping in and out of the keel, trying to rewrite it, using all their strength to lean backwards into the water to try and flip it. You don't want to expose yourself to those kind of temperatures for, for too long. But despite their predicament, the sailors make it clear they want to continue trying to right the catamaran themselves. We don't want to embarrass them too much, so we'll hold fire, keep an eye for any line in the water. The warmer crew stand by, keeping a close watch on the two casualties. You might think you're OK, but the reality is you're not OK. You're in an upside-down boat a mile offshore, drifting, and the boat's broken. There's not really going to be an easy way out for them. Turn that off. OK, guys, do you want a bit of help? Um... You've been in the water for a little while. We've had eyes on you for a little while. We want to get you out of this situation. It's a fine line between um, pushing your way in to try and help them do a job that they're more than capable of doing. Um, there could be a sense of pride, could be a sense of, you know, embarrassment. The weather's not getting any better. If we get onto your mast and help push it up, yeah? OK. The casualties finally accept the crew's offer of help to lift the nine-metre mast and attempt to tip the catamaran upright. So what we're going to try and do is walk it up, if you can. Yeah. OK, you both OK? The mast with the sail up, with the water laying on the mast, I wasn't expecting it to be as heavy as it was. It didn't quite go to plan. Not finding it very easy to turn. I mentioned to Dan it might be a good idea for them to try and drop their sail um, to get rid of a little bit of extra tension, a little bit of extra weight. With the mainsail lowered and no longer scooping up water, the mast is lighter and easier to lift. That's it. Keep hold of this. But there are other hazards floating beneath the surface. I'm just a bit cautious what that bit is in the water here. Yeah, so there's a line going directly down. It probably connected, as long as it ain't connected into us. We've got to be really cautious that we don't put the lifeboat in a situation where we end up becoming a casualty vessel because we've got a rope around a propeller. Yeah, if you can. Is it, is it line or is it wire? Some lines will float on the, on the top of the water and some will sink and they'll just be underneath the water. So those are the ones we need to really be cautious for. What's it connected to, buddy? Hopefully not us. Right, good. Wrap it, wrap it, wrap it round a couple of times. Happy? OK, we're now going to try and walk this up, all right? The crew prepare for a second attempt to right the catamaran mindful of the safety of the two casualties. Sweet, right, check for the people in the water. Both of them fell straight back into the water. Good effort, right, lads, sit back down. There's an element of, oh, quick, where they're gone, and sure enough, two heads pop up, OK. Yeah, oh, everyone's safe. I think the safest thing now is to get you back. Let's get you back in, yeah? I think we're going to have to set a tow up to drag you back in, all right? By the time we'd had this conversation, the wind had caught their front sail and they were, they were off. We're going to try and get back on the gym. We've got a bit of power in that little sail. Go on, then. With the wind filling the remaining sail, the two sailors steer the catamaran back to shore. Looks like they'll probably be all right. I think these lads had some good sailing knowledge, but even the most experienced sailors might still 
come unstuck one day and end up in that same situation. We'll stand by if needed, but we'll escort you back. Well, how did we, okay. yeah, how did we get in this situation? Murder. Friends Henry and Ferdinand, both 19, had headed to Walmer for a day sailing on their five and a half meter racing catamaran. There was a bit of swell, but we'd been out in considerably worse over the summer and um, we weren't particularly worried. It was a very sudden case of equipment failure. Henry's trapeze wire snapped. And so Henry fell into the water quite suddenly, quite abruptly. When I fell into the water, my first thought was, um, oh no. I waited for him to come back around. With Henry in the water, it was down to Ferdinand to turn the catamaran around and rescue his friend. At that point, it was, uh, it was just a question of a, of a gust hitting me at a slightly, slightly unfortunate moment. When I saw Ferdinand capsize, my first reaction was sort of, uh, oh dear, that's quite unfortunate. Both friends were now in the water, battling to get the catamaran upright again, unaware that back on shore, the alarm had been raised. The lifeboat coming towards us, we were thinking someone's had a really bad day somewhere out there. I think Ferdinand was quite keen to get the boat back up on our own, um, our own steam, but I, I, th I think it got to a point where, after we'd been trying to do it for about five minutes with them there, the RNLI took control of the situation. Nearly an hour after capsizing, and with a little helping hand from the warmer crew, Henry and Ferdinand finally made it back to shore. Things like this happen to even the most experienced sailors and uh, in a way probably are more likely to happen to, to the more experienced sailors because they're the ones who are, who are always pushing the limits. Everyone good? Yeah. Definitely don't let your ego get in the front of being rescued because at the end of the day, a, a bruised ego, we can all live that down, can't we? On the north coast of Wales, on the banks of the River Clwyd, lies the seaside resort town of Rhyl. Rhyl's a fantastic town full of great people. Uh, we have a beautiful sandy beach that we're very lucky to have. We're in North Wales. I think everyone is aware that the Welsh dragon is flying high around here. And another flag flies high above the town's new state-of-the-art lifeboat station, which opened in 2001. If you're walking down, you'll, you'll bump into it regardless of whether you're trying to avoid it or not. It's a great place to be. The team at Rill, uh, they're brilliant. You can rely on anyone and everyone. Rill is a 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We're on call throughout everything, no matter what. And with over 50 shouts last year, Rill is the busiest station in North Wales. We have very varied amount of shouts, so you know, everything from boats breaking down to sandbank jobs, people getting cut off by the tide. We have the missing persons, we have people in the water, we have a lot. December the 25th, a cold and crisp, festive afternoon. Spent a bit of time with my little girl, playing with her Christmas presents. Partner was cooking the the Christmas dinner. I was just waiting for me, uh, me grandma to sit down for her dinner and then I'd have tucked in. And then that's when the page went off. <laughs> I arrived at the station in my Christmas jumper. Um, Colin had his Christmas jumper on as well and then Dougie clambers out the car in his elf pyjamas and a Christmas hat. A call has come in from the Coast Guard. A person has been spotted in the water five miles west at Abigail Pensan. Lots of thoughts run through your mind, you know, as someone who's gone out for a paddle on Christmas Day and got into difficulties, so you just never know. A 
person in the water requires an immediate response. The station's D-class inshore boat is prepared and launched in under seven minutes. Three crew members on board, ETA to our scene, one zero, ten minutes, over. The atmosphere on the boat was serious. We, we were all thinking the same thing of the worst case scenario. The visibility was quite good, but it was cold, very cold. Although the conditions are calm, the sea temperature at this time of year is a mere nine degrees. You can't survive very long in the water in December. Not a chance, no. Captain Harbour visual, it's a Boeing of at least zero five degrees. Every second really does count. From the beach at Abigeli Pensan, Coast Guards direct the lifeboat towards the position of the person in the water. So they were coming us onto it through the radio, telling us where to go, and we were acting off them as our eyes because we weren't close to it at first. <laughs> If it is a person in the water, it's like a pinprick, really, so it's it's very difficult to locate a casualty in the water sometimes. What's up? Bag or something, isn't it? Like that bird. Yeah, it's a bird, yes. When you're searching, you're looking for anything, so whether that's, uh, you know, an object or you hear a sound or, you know, anything, but sometimes your mind can play tricks on you. 12 minutes after launching, the crew arrive at location just off Abigeli Pensan Beach. Yeah, I think so, yeah. But there's still no sign of the casualty, and the hope of finding them is diminishing by the minute. You expect the worst, because if I think the worst and the worst happens, then I'm ready for it. You always want the best outcome for everyone. After a couple of minutes of searching, there's a possible sighting. You can turn your report side now, you can just go past it, close to for sure. Straight ahead, mate. Yeah, you can see the light. The first glimpse that we've seen of the target, it was in the distance, but it did look like there was an arm in the air, so it looked like someone was waving towards us. On the nose, can you see it? It looked like as if someone was just lying on their back. Your heart sinks a little bit, but all you can do is make best speed towards that current position. I sort of had a bit of a gasp in me. I'd say, you know, it, it didn't look great. As we get a bit closer, you realise that this isn't waving. Um, there's no movement. The crew draw closer and discover why they could see no sign of life. Driftwood. What everyone thought was a person waving for help is in fact a four metre long log. Because of the, the seriousness that we thought the situation was going to be, and then it, for it to turn out that it was just a, a tree stump, we just looked at each other and laughed in a bit of disbelief, really. The crew call the Coast Guard, still watching anxiously from the shore. Just to confirm, is this the object that we're against now, over? Now, for your information, it's quite a large piece of driftwood. The way the log was sat in the swell gave it a really odd movement, so it did, really did mimic someone swimming at the time. Uh, it's quite an odd shape, and it's rolling around quite, uh, quite a lot in the waves. It was more like half a tree than a log. It was, you know, there was a big branch sticking out one way. It was quite thick, quite heavy. We made a decision to bring the log into shore, mainly so that any of the vessels in the area wouldn't get damaged by it, and also to stop any further people ringing it up and, and you know, causing further jobs. Yeah, no, it's not that heavy. So it's just a concern. Do you want it for... 
A yuletide log. <laughs> a yuletide log. A real person, a real LB. Yes, very good, very good. We'll, uh, we'll advise you once we're leaving the beach over. We transferred the log to the Coast Guard team who dragged it up and then they dealt with it from there and we carried on our way. Tidy, see you lads. Have a good Christmas. Push it out. When we got back to the boat house, we gave the boat a good clean down so it was ready for service and we all headed home to celebrate Christmas. Partner still left some of the washing up for me to do, so I didn't miss out on that really. The rest of the Christmas day was good, yeah. I, I ate a lot, I sat down, watched some TV, played a few games. It was, it was good, yeah. Whether it's Christmas Day or any other day of the year, you know, we're quite happy to go out and do our service. That's what we're there for. Nine months on from her paddleboard adventure in Wick that nearly ended in disaster, Sheena and her husband, Simon, are still reflecting on the lessons learned. I thought I was a relatively sensible person, but I obviously wasn't. I was wearing a black wetsuit because black is incredibly slimming, but um, you can't see anyone um, against the black sea on a black paddleboard with a black wetsuit. I don't see the sea quite as friendly as I did before. I still get afraid of the wind, but I think I'm becoming more confident. Undeterred by their unexpected encounter with the RNLI and Walmer, Henry and Ferdinand have been planning their next nautical challenge. So we are hoping at some point to be able to cross the English Channel. It's been something that we've dreamt of doing for a while um, because it's one of the one of the more iconic challenges in, in the world of sailing. I have been missing going out on the catamaran. I can't wait to uh, get back down and sail it. Hopefully we won't need uh, rescuing again. And after the loss of the ocean made at Cairnbulg Point, Gordon is ready to set sail again in her replacement. This is our new one. This is a Julie M. It was either going to go two ways, either find a new job or you get straight back on the horse and you go again. So we chose to go again. Definitely something that's helped us is having a new boat. We've got plenty more fishing to do yet. To say, unless the, the six numbers in the lottery come up, I'm afraid I'm going to be out there. A passing cruiser had seen a cow in the water. Suddenly, we could see this animal just with its head sticking out. You don't want to mess about. You get out of that situation as fast as you possibly can. Make my way into the shallow shoreline. I was thinking, right, is the digger still on top of him? Oh. You're in major pain here, but we need to move you or you won't go out. 